Okay, last but not least, we've got to talk about the fact that water is a good solvent. This is so important in our lives because all of our um, cells function on the fact that water is a good solvent, um, as do plants, as do animals. When a substance dissolves, we need to look at the fact that the particles of the solute separate from one another, the particles of the solvent need to separate from one another, and then the solute and the solvent particles need to be attracted to one another. So just as a reminder, the solute is what's being dissolved in the solvent. So both of those need to split. So for instance, let's use salt as an example. If I put sodium chloride, a lump of sodium chloride, into a glass of water, what needs to happen is that the sodium chloride particles separate. It needs to form sodium ions and chlorine ions. Um, and then the particles of the solvent need to separate. So water needs to separate. So um, from one another. So I'm not talking about the, the covalent bond. The molecule doesn't separate, but the actual water molecules separate. So then the solute and the solvent need to be attracted to one another. So you can basically see it, this happening here. If we think that this was salt, so sodium chloride, we can see here, we'll pretend that the blue ones... Oh, we can actually tell because the red are the oxygen, so the red has a negative. The negative will be attracted to the positive. So you can see here the red's pulling out the blue, so the blue has to be uh, sodium ion. So it's pulling the sodium ion out here. Here you can see the hydrogens are, are attracted to the chloride ion and they're pulling it out. So the first thing that needs to happen is these water molecules need to separate apart from each other and then they can separate. Um, if they're attracted, they can pull away the solute particles, but they must be attracted to the solute. So a solute will dissolve if the solute to solvent attractions, so for instance between salt and water, is stronger than the water to water attraction, or sorry, the salt to salt attraction, or the water to water attraction. If that happens, Water, as you can clearly see here, can pull apart a beautiful ionic lattice here. But this attraction needs to be greater than this attraction or else they will stay as a ionic um, lattice. Okay, substances that dissolve readily in water have either ionic or polar covalent bonding. And they form one of three different groups. They're either polar covalent compounds that can form hydrogen bonds with water. So polar covalent compounds that can form hydrogen bonds with water. Polar covalent molecular compounds that ionize. Or they're ionic compounds. And we're going to discuss each of those now. Polar covalent compounds that can form hydrogen bonds with water. Some covalent molecular substances dissolve easily in water. And there's a reason for this. Something like sugar and ethanol, and you saw this in your prac. Sugar and ethanol are both covalent molecular substances. What's special about them is that they have these polar functional groups on them. So these molecules are polar in character and usually through one, or usually because of one or more hydroxy groups. Whenever you see the hydroxy group, you can think that this is a polar molecule. The more hydroxy groups, the more polar the molecule. When you have a lovely hydroxy group like this, it will attract two water molecules via hydrogen bonding. OH, OH. And here's just an example here of the oxygen being attracted to the hydrogen. And this, of course, is strong attraction because it's the two lots of hydrogen bonding setting up again. The more polar the molecules of a molecular compound, the more likely it is to dissolve in water. So if a compound is polar, it will dissolve in water more readily. So we look at something like vitamin B and vitamin C, which are water-soluble. So here's vitamin C, one, two, three, four hydroxy groups. 
vitamins A, D, E, and K are not water soluble, they're fat soluble. One tiny little hydroxy group on the end here, and the rest of the molecule is nonpolar. So it's got very, very low water solubility compared to all of these OH groups up here on vitamin C, which is very water soluble. Like dissolves like, and that's a common expression we use in chemistry. Like dissolves like. If something is very polar, it will dissolve in something polar. If something is nonpolar, it will dissolve in something nonpolar. So the larger the nonpolar fraction of the molecule, the less soluble it is in water. Oil is not soluble in water. Oil will float on water. It will not mix because it is a large nonpolar fraction. Water molecules form hydrogen bonds with each other in preference to weak attractions with nonpolar molecules. Water molecules would much rather attract to itself than it would to a nonpolar um, oil molecule. Why would it? There is nothing there to attract to the water. The water has stronger affinity or cohesive attraction with itself. The second group are polar covalent molecular compounds that ionize. Okay. When some polar covalent molecules such as hydrogen chloride or hydrochloric acid come into contact with water, the following happens. The compound breaks apart. The shared electron pair goes with the more electronegativity electronegative atom, which is the chloride. So what actually happens is the following. The attraction of the water to this other hydrogen is so great that it rips that hydrogen off and it causes the chloride ion to form and just float around by itself. So it actually pulls away. So the affinity of the water to the hydrogen is stronger than the hydrogen to the, um, to the chloride. So it forms what's called a hydronium ion and a chloride ion. And you can see it here. So you've got hydrogen chloride plus water makes hydronium plus Chloride. This is ionizing the molecular compound, and this is why it's a polar covalent molecular compound that ionizes. It is forming an ion only because the affinity or the attraction of this hydrogen to this oxygen is greater than the attraction of the hydrogen to the chloride. So it's basically ripping apart this molecule. And there it is again. And just to explain again, the chlorine forms an anion chloride and the H plus attaches to the water molecule to form a hydronium ion. Both the hydronium and the chloride will be surrounded by water which form iron dipole bonds. So here the iron will be attracted to other water molecules and this hydronium will be attracted to other water molecules forming iron, this will be the iron, to dipole which is basically two water bonds. Last but not least ionic compounds are soluble in water and we've discussed that. When some ionic substances, example sodium chloride, are placed in water, the positive ends of the water molecules are attracted to the anions and the negative ends of the water molecules are attracted to the cations. And this forms an iron dipole attraction. So it's iron to a dipole. Sodium chloride forms iron, so you've got sodium or chloride, which is the iron, and again that word dipole, water is a dipole. So it's an iron dipole attraction. And we can see it here. This lovely little chloride molecule is surrounded by water molecules. This sodium um, 
iron is surrounded by water molecules as well. And that's all dissolving is, is basically water molecules being attracted to a lattice and pulling those ions out of the lattice one by one. Be careful though, because not all ionic compounds are water soluble. Remember, the water needs to be more attracted to the ions in the lattice than the ions in the lattice are to themselves. If these guys have greater attraction to one another, why would they let go and jump on with the water molecules? It's a bit like relationships. If you're in a good relationship, you don't look out at the other people floating around trying to get your attention. However, if your relationship is not very strong and you have more attraction to someone that walks past, you say, see you later, to your partner and off you go. So for insoluble ionic substances, high amounts of energy are required to separate the ions from the lattice. And that's why sometimes um, uh, heating will help to, to break that apart. But generally, if something is insoluble in water, it, it's going to have very low solubility. And here's just a picture again, and you can see here the lovely iron dipole attraction. Iron dipole attraction. And when we write it, we write it as sodium chloride dissolves in water because that water is not being used up. It's just surrounding the ions and it creates sodium ions and chlorine ions or chloride ions, sorry. Okay, water particles are in a continuous state of random motion. They will pull the anions and cations out um, of, of the outer part of the crystal. Okay, so they pull, 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 pull until there's none left. And that's why you see a block of salt dissolving and it takes a while. And here's just another picture here um, that the solute will eventually disperse evenly throughout um, the liquid. And in another picture. Okay, and this is just a solubility table here that you've already used, I think, in year 10. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, this shows you, this is in your textbook, um, table 10.4, so in chapter 10. This shows you that most of these compounds, um, most compounds that are formed with these ions are soluble. So nitrates are all soluble, there's no exceptions. Acetates or ethanoates are all soluble. Sodium and potassium, all soluble. Ammonium, all soluble. After that, we have some exceptions. Whenever you see something attached or an ionic compound with chloride in it, it will be soluble, except if it's silver, mercury, or lead chloride. Anything with a bromide is soluble, except silver, mercury, or lead bromide. And the same applies here with these exceptions. If we look at insoluble compounds, all sulfides are insoluble except for sodium, which if you have a look was up on our table, potassium, which if you have a look is up there as well, also lithium and ammonium. Ammonium's on our table there too. Carbonates, all insoluble, so they do not dissolve in water except for again sodium, potassium and lithium, which are in our always exceptions up here. So you can use this table. This table will always be given to you when you are trying to work out if something is soluble or insoluble. So now you should be able to do all of these chapter questions. And there's just one more thing that I just wanted to point out, and I need to flick back for that. When we have a look at writing equations, we use now we can tell whether things are solid or whether they are aqueous by using the solubility table. You need to write the states down when you're writing equations. The other thing that we need to take note of is where the water is in this equation. You'll see here, when we're looking at the dissolving of an ionic compound, water is put above the arrow because water is needed 
to break these into sodium and into chloride, but water is not actually used up in the equation. So it's placed above the arrow. It's not involved in the breakdown of sodium into sodium ions, but it's needed to pull those ions apart. So it's not actually reacting with it and forming a new substance. If we have a look at this one though, when we're looking at polar covalent molecular substances that ionize, we can see here that hydrogen chloride plus water, water is used up because it makes a new product called hydronium. So when water is actually being used up and creating a new product, you need to write that in the equation. And water is always, always, always written as a liquid. And last but not least, the other one that I just wanted to show you was the example of, of ethanol dissolving in water. And whenever you see anything dissolve in water, remember the water is not being used in the equation. It is just facilitating the dissolving. And here you can see it's just as simple as ethanol liquid becoming ethanol aqueous. So we would do the same with glucose or sugar. Sugar liquid, or sorry, sugar solid becomes sugar aqueous. And it's as simple as that, but you need to put the water above the arrow. The only time you put the water in the equation is if it's actually involved in making a new product like hydronium.